Hello guys, uh, welcome to another lesson. In this video, we are going to cover information on the calculations um, that are associated with the heating curve. So we're gonna be talking about um, going through the different uh, phase changes um, and also the different states of matter for water. So a quick recap on some of the information that um, is required for you to know before we get to the calculations. So the first is going to be enthalpy. Um, we also know and call it uh, heat. And um, don't forget that it is the change in internal energy of a substance. So the overall change in the heat. Um, of course, um, we have talked about endothermic and exothermic reactions. So don't forget that if your enthalpy uh, calculation results it's a negative number, then we know that that would represent an exothermic reaction. If it's a plot positive, then it represents an endothermic reaction. And we have those um, two statements written right here at the very bottom. So those are two very important uh, concepts. Now, um, whenever we talk about endothermic, exothermic, remember that we are referring back to the idea that we have a system and we have surroundings and the heat is going to enter or exit the surrounding depending on um, the scenario. So you will see um, either having um, exothermic, endothermic reactions, and of course, they're the opposites of each other. Now, whenever we talk about energy, heat, uh, we utilize the unit joules. Um, or calories, and yes, um, those are the calories that we see in food packages. Um, and back at the very bottom here, um, I put in some information about calories and how they are represented in food packages. But in this unit, we really don't re uh, cover this information. We really don't talk about this. Um, we're mostly going to be focusing on joules. So in your star reference sheet, you will see a section that looks like this. This is the information that I just mentioned in the previous video. So you do have access to this on, on that um, handout. So another thing that we've also talked about has been thermal equilibrium. And um, that's just really the idea that whenever there is contact between, between two different objects, um, and it can be not necessarily solid, but really just to any things, right? So between a system and a surrounding, um, the heat will flow from the area of high energy or high temperature um, to the lower temperature, the lower energy. And that transfer of energy will continue until they have um, the same temperature, so constant temperature. Um, here on this um, visual that we have on screen, I have two blocks, A and B, and we are representing hot with a reddish color and blue with, um, I'm sorry, cold with the blue color. And we can see with the arrow that the heat is being transferring from A to B. And over time, we will see that both reach the same temperature, of course, assuming that there's no addition of heat in any other way. So that we call thermal equilibrium. And that's truly the goal of heat, having a system where everything is, is the same temperature. So um, here again, another visual, we have 100 to 50 and we have Q representing heat. So we are having that exchange of uh, that flow of energy from the block of 100 to the block of 50, and that will continue until they both are the same. So we can note, show that at the bottom of the screen with the two arrows pointing on um, both ways because we, at that point, represent that the equilibrium has been achieved. Now, we can also represent that graphically, and this is something that was mentioned previously in another video very, very um, quickly. So just don't forget, um, the idea is thermal equilibrium. The heat uh, flow is going to continue until equilibrium is reached. And of course, not everything will eventually reach thermal equilibrium because as you can see on the visual here, um, we are only taking into consideration two substances, the one with higher temperature and the one with lower temperature. But as you know, everything is interacting with multiple things, not just one. So thermal equilibrium can be a, a quite a tricky thing. Um, but for the purposes of our class, um, we will uh, pretty much just talk about two things at a time. Now, um, in this example that I have here on screen is going to be, um, honestly, all you're doing is averaging out the, the temperatures. So we have in the first example, um, a mixture of two liquids, one that was at 50 degrees, the other one was 110. So if we go by the idea that the heat exchange is going to continue and the temperature is going to average out, then we would just add these two. So 50 uh, plus 110, which is going to give us um, 
160 degrees, right? But because there's two different objects and we're reaching equilibrium, we would divide that by two and we would get a total of 80 degrees. So that would be the final temperature of both liquids. And that would be the same thing for the second example. So we have object one having a temperature of 28, object two having a temperature of uh, 25, and that would give us, uh, oh, sorry, I should write it down. 28 plus 25 um, is going to give us a total of 53. Of course, we divide that by two, and that would give us a, a final temperature of 26.5 degrees Celsius. So thermal equilibrium um, calculations are pretty straightforward. Uh, so this is pretty much it, right? So now that we have covered this information, let's go and start talking about some of the calculations we're going to use. And I'm gonna refer back to the heating curve in just a moment, but I want to talk about the equations first. So we have the heat of fusion, um, which would be Q equals MHF. Q is the representation of the energy, M is going to be the mass, and um, HF would be the constant. Now for water, we have a constant, and a lot of different substances have, but the one that we're really just going to focus on in this class is mostly going to be water. And the constant, I have it written here at the bottom, so that would be um, 334 joules per gram. And sometimes, if you look online, they will use this one at the very bottom of the right, on the right side of the screen, of 340, and that's just, um, it's, that's the one that sometimes people use uh, that are that has been rounded. Um, so in our class, we're going to use 334. So any time that you are performing a calculation for melting or freezing, specifically the, those two phase changes, this is the equation that we are going to use. And we'll do an exam two examples um, in just a moment. So we call that heat of fusion. Um, now for the heat of vaporization equation, you notice they're very similar. The only thing that changes is that constant. And that is because the heat of vaporization, we're specifically talking about vaporization, so boiling, right? And the condensation phase changes. And just like the one for melting and freezing, we have a constant that is going to be uh, 2,230. So again, this is going to represent the mass of your object or your substance, which in this scenario would be water. And then this value right here would be the 2,230. And again, this is only used when we talk about the phase changes of vaporization and condensation. Again, sometimes online you will see that they use this value here at the bottom, but that's just the one that it's used um, for rounding purposes. But in our class, we're going to use a 2,230. Okay, so we talked about the two um, that go through in the heating curve for melting, freezing, and vaporization and condensation. So what happens in between the solid part, the liquid part, and the gas part of the heating curve. Well, we've got an equation for that. So here, um, I have it listed um, towards the middle bottom of the screen. And we have the, we, a lot of people call it the MCAT uh, equation because the delta kind of looks like an A, so MCAT. So, but it's really MC delta T, so for temperature. So we're gonna have Q, which is a heat that is absorbed or released. We are going to also have our specific heat, which um, we have previously discussed in class. We performed a, a online simulation for it. And then we're going to have the mass, and then we're gonna have delta T, which is going to be the change in temperature. And this is something that a lot of students um, usually um, get confused on because they need to remember that in order for us to determine the change in temperature, we do the final, right? So final temperature, minus the initial and it's written down here with the f and the i subscripts so don't forget that information um it's really final minus initial and if you do them backwards then you might have your um, equation giving you endothermic or exothermic um, but it would be wrong because you did the temperatures backwards so it's always final minus initial so now that we looked at the three equations um let's talk about where they belong in the heating curve. So we know the heating curve looks kind of like this, right? It's kind of like a little steps. And we know we have our solid, liquid, and gas sections. And in those three sections, we are going to use the MCAT equation. 
So the one that has a temperature change, because in those three areas of the equate of the heating curve, that's where temperature is actually increasing or decreasing, depending if it's endothermic or exothermic. Now, when we have this section for freezing and melting, we are going to use the heat of fusion equation. Where we have the section for vaporization, we're going to use the other constant, the 2230, um, for the heat of vaporization equation. So, so far, I've given you a lot of information in terms of the equations, right? We have to use one for solid, liquid, and gas, and then the other two are specifically for either freezing, melting, or vaporization and condensation. So this graph that we have in front of us right now is important because it tells you where in the graph you need to use which equation. So let's look at an example. Um, oh, I actually forgot to mention um, right here at the bottom right side of the screen, we have the information for the specific heat of water. Now, these are constants as well. These are the values that we are going to use for our class. Um, if you go online, a lot of times they have like 4,184, like in the thousands, but that's because they're using um, kilograms instead of grams. In our class, we're going to use them in grams. So these should be the values that we use. Let's look at an example because honestly, that's the best way to learn, right? By doing. Um, so here we have an example that states to calculate the amount of energy required to heat a 450 ml sample of water from negative 5 to 110 degrees Celsius. So let's think about what it's telling us. We have a sample, so the mass in all of our equations here in blue at the bottom is going to be 400. So mass is going to be 450. And because we're talking about water, one milliliter of water equals to one gram of water. And that stands true for water, okay? So don't get confused with other substances. So we're talking about then a sample of 450 grams. So that's the number that we're going to use for all of our equations. Then we also have to think about what is happening in this um, example. We are going from negative five degrees Celsius to 110 degrees. So that means that our values for water, right? Because water freezes and melts at zero and boils, um, that should be a zero, and that looks like a six, but it's a zero. And it boils or condenses, right, at 100. So that means that, and again, those are zeros, not six. Um, I don't know why it comes out like a six, but anyway, um, we are going to have a, a substance that is going to go from negative five, so somewhere like down here, right, ne oops, negative five, all the way to 110. So basically what I'm saying here is, is that we're going to go and we are going to go through the solid state. We're going to go through melting because we're increasing in temperature, right? We're also going to go through the entire liquid state. We're also going through the entire um, section of vaporization. And then we're increasing our gas temperature to 110. So we're basically going through the entire heating curve in this scenario. Will that always be the case? No, right? So um, we're gonna look at another example. Um, and I misnumber them here in the title. Um, yeah, we're gonna go through another example that is going to be um, where we don't go through all the states. So let's first figure out, okay, well, from negative five to zero, I'm going to use the, val the equation that is going to be for a solid because we know that between those two temperatures, our water will be a solid. So we're going to use the MCAT equation. So we are going to have um, the MCAT equation, which is going to be the mass, right? Which is we know is going to be, um, pen, is going to be 450. We also know that we have the C, which is the specific heat. And because this section right here is going to be a solid, we know then that we have to use a value for a solid, which is 2.09. So 2.09. And then we're going to multiply that by the temperature change. So remember that is final. So let me write it here on top. Temperature change is always going to be final minus the initial. So for our example here, the final temperature was zero, and we're gonna do that minus negative five, because that was our initial. So we know already based on our math knowledge that that's going to be like a plus five. 
But anyway, so we're going to put that in the calculator in just a moment. Let's continue. So once we reach zero, so from zero to zero, we're going to go through melting. And I'm going to try and squeeze that here on the side. So melting. And we are going to, instead of using the MCAT equation, we're going to use the one that is used for the melting slash freezing. And that's going to be this first equation here. So we are going to have Q equals mass. Again, we're using the constant that we were given 450. And we are going to then have the value for 334. And again, that is because that's the section in the graph that is going to be melting. Then once we reach temperature zero, we're going to go all the way to 100 because during that time, we are going to go through the state of um, liquid. So we are then going to have again, now we're going to talk about again the MCAT equation. So we're going to have 450. And then we're going to have now, because we're talking about the liquid state, right? Because it's a solid and liquid and gas. We're going to have the value for liquid, which is going to be 4.184. So 4.184. And then we're going to have our temperature change, which is going to be final minus initial. So it would be 100 minus zero. And once we reach 100, we are going to go through the phase of vaporization. So that would be from 100 to 100. And remember, when we go through the phase changes, so like through melting and vaporization, we don't have a change in temperature. The, kinet the energy is not kinetic, it's potential. And it's used to go through the phase change. So we're going to use now the last equation here. Um, the mass times 2,230, because that is the equation that belongs to the section of the graph that represents vaporization. So again, we're going to have 450, and we're going to have the constant 2,230. And again, those are constants that we use for water. Then we're almost there, right? Because we know we are increasing all the way to 110 degrees Celsius. So then we're going to be in the gas state. So we are going to go from 100 after it finishes vaporizing to 110. And now we're going to go back to the MCAT equation because remember, that's the one we use for solid, liquid, and gas. This right here is gas. So 450 because that's the mass times the constant for specific heat at the gas. So this very last one, 1.84. And these are constants, guys. So a lot of times students tell me, where did you get those numbers from? Those are constants that we use for water, depending on its state of matter, solid, liquid, or gas. So the last thing here in the equation is to have final minus initial. So the final was 110, the initial was 100. So these would be all the five calculations that we need to use. What we're going to do next is going to be multiply them all out and add them up because we want to know the total amount of energy that is required to heat the 450 gram sample from negative 5 all the way to 110. So this is why it's so important that we know and understand our heating curves because when we do these calculations, as you can see, it's, in lot, it's split into a lot of different pieces. And again, it's split up because each section of the graph is being represented by a different equation and a different constant. So the calculation itself is not difficult, but it has to be split up. And you need to understand that we have to go through the state of matter, so solid, liquid, and gas, and the phase changes. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to um, give you guys a chance to multiply this out. In just a moment, I'll show you what the uh, final answer for this should be. So all we're doing is multiplying and adding up all of our values. Okay, now that we have had a chance to multiply and add up all of our masses, this would be our final answer. So this is the amount of joules that we would need to heat up a 450 gram sample of water from negative five degrees Celsius to 110, going through the solid, melting, liquid, vaporization, and gas. Let's look at one more example. So here we are asked how many joules are released when 300 grams of water are cooled from 25 degrees to negative 5 degrees. So this one, as we can see from the wording, it's a um, exothermic reaction because we are decreasing in temperature. So I'm just going to do a very rough sketch here at the top of the screen of my heating curve. And because this is going to be 
um, a, a a cooling curve, we are going to do them to a backwards, right? So we know we are going to go from, um, let's see, 25 degrees Celsius to negative five degrees Celsius. So we know based on the temperature that this is never a gas. This started as a liquid and it went down to a solid. So we don't have to do as much calculation as the one in the previous example because we are not going through the entire heating curve. So we are going to go we're going to start at 25 degrees Celsius and we are going to decrease all the way to zero because during that time, our substance is a liquid. Once it reaches zero, right, we are going to then go through the process of freezing. And that is because we have reached temperature zero and that's when water freezes. Once we reach zero and go through that phase change, and become a solid, then we are going to have the temperature from zero to negative five. And during those, those temperatures, it's going to be, our sample is going to be a solid. So here, again, we're not going through vaporization and we're not going through gas because we were never at those temperatures. Okay, so now let's use our, calcul our equations and plug in the numbers that we need in the constants. So for the liquid state, we're going to use the MCAT equation. So our mass is going to be 300. Um, and then we're going to have our specific heat during the liquid state, which would be 4.184. So 4.184. And then the temperature change. So final minus initial. So 0 minus 25. Okay. And then we have our freezing phase change. And for freezing, we are going to use the equation for... Um, the heat of fusion. So that would be 300, um, which is that's the mass of the water. And in this scenario, we're going to do negative 334 because this is an exothermic reaction. So the heat we know is going to be leaving the system. So we have to use our, our value for heat as a negative because it's exothermic. Now for the solid, we're going to go from zero to negative five and we're going to use once again, the MCAT equation. So we're gonna have 300 times the specific heat of water in the solid state. So that's going to be 2.09, so 2.09. And then the temperature difference, so right, the, the change. So final, which was negative five minus initial, which was zero. So let's take a moment, multiply this out, and then look at what our final answer is once we add up all those answers. Okay, so our final answer uh, would be a negative value for the joules, and not because the energy is negative, but because the energy was released in the process. So this is how much energy needs to be removed from 300 grams of water at 25 degrees Celsius to decrease it to negative 5. So once again, guys, um, for our calculations like this, they will involve water. They will utilize the values that we have here. These are standard numbers, constants that we have to use every time. The only here thing that will change would be the mass of your sample and the temperatures that it's going through. You have to be very careful when you do the calculations to determine if you're going from solid liquid to gas, vice versa, and which of the phase changes we are utilizing in that particular example. All right, guys, in later videos, we're going to continue doing more examples like this one. Uh, but for today, we do need to do some practice. Thank you all guys for watching.